Welcome to the Office Hours Podcast. This is TK Coleman and Isaac Morehouse. We're like the geek squad for your professional development. Got a job you're trying to get, a work-related issue you're trying to resolve, a project you're trying to complete, an obstacle that's holding you up? Well, you're in the right place. You bring the problem, we bring the nuts and bolts. This is where you get philosophical insight and actionable advice on how to take charge of your life and career. What's going on today, man? What are we going to talk about up in here? Hey, man, we just here to pull people out of the sunken place. Hey, I got Perrier today, and I didn't know this until I started drinking it, and you were like, is that because of Kanye? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what you were talking about. So we had to watch this video of Kanye West on Saturday Night Live dancing in a Perrier bottle costume. Perrier. Looking like he was having too much fun. It was unbelievable. It was like mesmerizing. <laughs> I couldn't stop watching. So this this is now a tribute to Kanye West. Tribute to Kanye. Um, hey man, I have to point it out. The the smoothie and the shirt matching, that's beautiful. I like I it. I did not you intend that? that. This is uh ClickUp, one of our Praxis business partners. I got this shirt from them. Shout out to ClickUp. And then I just made this smoothie with blueberries and it turned out it's yeah. And accidental. it just so happened to be the case. I love it. Well, so I'm kinda close. I got Drinking bubbly today, and uh, dude, got a little. Don't yeah. don't don't give away the free advertisement like that. Oh no no, that's cool. We can do that. I'm gonna turn it around because bubbly until y'all ready to pay me. <laughs> I ain't gonna let y'all play me. Yeah, we need some Perrier so money as well. So hey, I actually went back and watched a little bit of our last episode where I was like, dude, it's awkward to look at the camera. We're having a conversation, <laughs> and I see it. I'm just like. The whole time? And I'm like, that's kind of weird, too. So since some people do watch, apparently. So I'm going to like... Yeah, man, th- 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 this is something I've always disagreed with you on. People watch video podcasts. Oh, I agree that they do. I just think that people have mental disorders <laughs> if they use YouTube to consume audio content. That's the Why only, that's the only watch, place only place I consume Why would you want to watch it? It's such a horrible format content. for that. There's an app with like a beautiful RSS feed and you like... You subscribe to it. It's so clean. You do it while you're on a walk, while you're driving. Why do I want to have to like look at my What about screen? TED Talks? Where do you listen to? Because because do you listen to the TED podcast or on YouTube? I haven't watched a TED Talk in like four years. I don't think so. Yeah. I used to watch them all the time, and I would either watch them on like a TED app on my smart TV. Yeah. Or um, just watch them online. Because those are like eight minutes, and they often have a visual element. Yeah. And like it's a presentation. It's yeah. meant to be seen. Yeah, yeah. This isn't meant to be seen. <laughs> this is meant to be seen. <laughs> I mean, I, this, I, I this meant face to be seen. is meant to be seen. God made this face for God, God made me to be seen. Hold <laughs> right, on, let's, let's get into it. <laughs> Jibber jabber. Hey, well, well actually, man... Um, since you don't watch TED Talks, you probably don't know about this. No, not like as a principal. I just, I just haven't seen one in a while. Jeez. Since you're too good for TED Talks. <laughs> so I actually uh, just had an interesting experience. I put in an app to do a TED Talk, TEDx Charleston. And um, my app was about just a lot of the work that we're doing, how the education game is, is, is changing. And, and I wanted to kind of say my piece on it. So I had a phone interview yesterday. I made it to the second round. And it it's was kind of like when you tried to make it onto uh, American Idol. Right? Yeah. Very similar experience. <laughs> Very similar experience, man. Um, brings a tear to my eye, you know, <laughs> the, the dream that never was. <laughs> I'm going to wait till but, I'm like 60. But I got everything I wanted to out of the journey. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> uh, you don't have to be a successful musician. You By can the way, just. If you've never heard TK's story of trying out for American Idol, go check it out. His chapter of uh, Why Haven't You Read This Book? It's uh, Why Haven't You Auditioned for American Idol? It's brilliant. So, anyway, you got this call for a like a second wave filter to see if they want you to do a TEDx Charleston, correct? Yeah, yeah. So uh, so we did a phone interview. Started off, you know, just kind of like, uh, you know, answering questions about myself, talking about my background, and then we got into talking about the work that we do at Praxis. Talking about Praxis? Talking about Praxis. I'm like, what are we talking about, Praxis? <laughs> so it's funny, man, because in our day-to-day work, all we encounter is, you know, from the general public, this sort of, initial resistance to the idea that you don't need a college degree to succeed. And we're so accustomed to that. Um, There are a lot of young people who are looking for alternatives, but a lot of the adults in and around their lives are really nervous for them because it's kind of stigmatized to be a college opt-out. And so a lot of people want to opt out of college, but they hesitate to do so because they don't want that stigma. And so I was talking about this with them as, as sort of like the premise for something that I want to discuss and, and kind of liberating people from this 
this this belief that they are less than or not truly educated. And it was funny because I was so caught off guard by the fact that this assumption wasn't shared. Not the assumption that you can't make it without that you can make it without a college degree, but the assumption that there actually is a stigma attached to people so, who drop so out of college. He, so he thought the message of you don't need a degree to succeed was just like too plain vanilla. Everybody knows that, uncontroversial, not interesting enough for a TED talk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you told me this yesterday that that like caught you off guard when he was like, yeah. "Okay, tell me that's no, that's old news. Tell yeah, me what's yeah. interesting about it. What was your response, or rather, if you were to give a TED talk on you know this topic, what angle would you take to to bring home the point that this actually is a controversial thing, or there's there's more here to be discussed? This is not just common knowledge and common sense that no, everybody agrees with that you can succeed without college." Yeah, so, I mean, so I, I talked about our experience and, and how we encounter this all the time. How, you know, even in many coaching sessions, you'll have people that are happy. Not, not, not among young people, by the way. Like that has changed dramatically since we started five years oh, ago. Oh, absolutely. Our absolutely. customers and potential customers, they know that college is a total waste. They like know it. It's uncontroversial to them. They still have a very hard time deciding to opt out purely because of parents. And yeah. parents and sort of, other adults in their life who yeah. like will think they're a complete loser, even if they succeed in their career, yeah. just because they didn't go to college. Well, right? well yeah, it, it, there's just this really high social cost. And so when I talked about that, it, it, and I don't know how much of this was devil's advocate, just to see how I would respond to it. I don't, I don't know how much of it was just. I mean, I mean, I imagine you work for Ted. You're exposed to such a diverse range of ideas. This guy sounds like a pretty brilliant guy who talked to a lot of different people. We want so, to make sure that people bring something instead yeah. of just like we need children to have opportunities. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's easy to devolve into that BS. Yeah, but 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 you know, he. I mean, he he really challenged me on that and just didn't really find that idea to be so controversial. So it, it got me thinking about it. I talked to you about it afterwards, and I don't like being in conversations, man, where I'm just completely stuck, completely caught off, caught off guard, and I just had to think about that. You know, like, okay, so what would I say if I had a second shot at that? Or, you know, how can I allow his different set of assumptions to kind of challenge me to think about things in a different way? And so I came up with an analogy um, for where we are with college, that sort of gets I'm gonna to the play the Cornet Van Stratton, the guy who called me out for not giving credit to uh, somebody for an idea. <laughs> we came up with this analogy, TK. We came up with this analogy. I was there inspiring you. <laughs> Don't retell the story that way. Come on. <laughs> Cornet would be proud. Like. <laughs> <laughs> he probably knows. Episode, whatever, of, you know. Sorry, go ahead. What's the give us the analogy that um, that we came up with together? So the analogy, <laughs> <laughs> even more awkward. So the analogy is interracial dating. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm in an interracial marriage, um, and there's something really interesting about interracial dating today. First of all, the idea of being in an interracial marriage is pretty uncontroversial. This isn't 1950, this is 2018. And if you were to ask the average person, hey, how do you feel about two people of different races falling in love with each other? Do you think they should suppress that love or do you think you know, they should just choose to be with each other? Most people would say, hey, look, as long as they're good people, they love each other and they make each other better, Race shouldn't matter. That's what most people would say. It'd be very rare group that'd be like, take a hard stance, like, that's wrong, you shouldn't do that. So if you survey people, everyone's in favor of interracial dating. However, that's at the general theoretical level. Some guy, some gal, somewhere, marrying somebody of some race that's other than their own. But when that issue comes knocking at your door, hey, everything changes. Meet my boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. When it gets to the level of, hey, mom and dad, meet my boyfriend, meet my girlfriend, he, she is white, black, Arab, Asian, yep. Indian. Now, even if you are from, an open-minded from person. Cleveland, you know, some crazy, <laughs> crazy yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> LeBron fan. Stuff, stuff <laughs> like just something weird. Too far. <laughs> right. Like that's just too much. <laughs> any race, but not, uh, any, not any sport. Anyway. But when that happens, even if you are just a totally cool, open-minded person, whether you like it or not, you're going to be forced to participate in conversations 
that take you a little bit out of your comfort zone. You can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. And, you know, because if you're not asking the questions, other people are going to ask the questions. Anyone that is in an interracial marriage, there are certain topics you've had to address, even if you think those topics are stupid to address. Topics like, well, what are you going to do if your children are confused about what race they are? Or what about your grandchildren? Or how are you going to deal with the fact that some people aren't ready for this? Or what if you get funny looks? There's a whole series of concerns and questions that people don't even know that they have mm. until they experience that firsthand. Because, you know, if you're, like you said, if you ask people, do you think there's any problem with interracial marriage? No, not at all. And it's like, you know, hey, mom and dad, I just got engaged to a black dude. And then you're like, you know, this series of questions and concerns that I think most people don't think they have ahead of time. Yeah. All of a sudden, there's this burden of proof that's much higher. That's place, and again, questions that you know have to be answered. You don't normally be like, well, what about your kid's identity racially? If it's like you know two people yeah. of the same race, you just you don't you don't think about those kind of questions. All of a sudden, you're going to get this. You're going to get a higher level of scrutiny. You're going to make people uncomfortable. Yeah, and, and so, and I think that's exactly where we are with college. I think the idea that college isn't for everybody completely uncontroversial. The idea that we all have different needs and different educational preferences and, hey, some people should go to trade school. Some people should start their own business. As long as we keep it general, that's no problem at all. Everybody knows about Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg or some other special person and, and even that didn't today, go to college. Like just, you know, smart, ambitious, hardworking person, people now know, or at least many people. Yeah. I still wouldn't say it's like totally mainstream, but that right, like right. you can absolutely launch a career without a degree. Right. Intellectually, a lot of people get that. But on a gut level, e even people I talk to who are like into startups and the cutting edge, like, yeah, oh, yeah. college is a total waste. I think, you know, Praxis is amazing, blah, blah, blah. But like my kids are going to go to college because, you know, they, I mean, they got into a decent school and like, you know. And I'm like, no, I don't know. I literally don't know. Yeah. Why? Like, why yeah. is that so important to you? And again, not like it's bad yeah. to go to college if you've got some reason or whatever, but that Fear, actually in my, I, I did a, I think it was the last uh, Isaac Morehouse podcast episode. I interviewed Brian Kaplan about his book, The Case Against Education, which is a lot of great stuff. Yeah, we yeah. disagree pretty hardcore on what the implications of his findings are. And one of the things that he argues is like, well, you still need it for a job, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, we've proven that a couple hundred times and we're going to prove it thousands and millions more times. Yeah. Um, it's just a religious devotion at this point. And, and this is pretty easily provable because we have encountered people who like, hey, here's a way you can get a job without any debt four years early. Like how far ahead you'll be. You're happier, you're more fulfilled. And we've encountered young people who do that and have to start doing things that make you weird. Things that are uniquely you, not like faking it and pretending to be a weirdo, right? But like leaning in to your weirdest, most unique traits and things and not worrying about what people think. Because by definition, if you try to stay unweird, you'll be average. And you think about like really highly successful people in whatever field they're in, you know, like they tend to have a ton of very eccentric behaviors. And I would argue it's not like, oh, they got rich and so you can afford to be eccentric. That might be part of it. But like to achieve a very high level of mastery, you have to be. You have to. You have to be able to tune out all the pressures to do things that make others comfortable and do the things that bring the highest return to you, which are going to be weird and eccentric. So like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, they're probably got a bunch of weird eccentric things because almost all highly productive, successful people do. And I would argue they couldn't be at the level that they are if they didn't have a lot of weird habits and things that they didn't yield on, even that are like weird for other people. But early in your career, it's the other way around. So I just, I think there's like a, like it's okay to kind of like, all right, how can I sort of figure out what's not going to make people too uncomfortable early on? I think that's actually an important skill. And I don't think that means selling out or just going with the crowd. I think those are different things. Being a little bit more intelligent about that and trying not to alienate people. The further along you get, I think you need to stop caring about alienating people or else it will absolutely hold you back and you'll only be average. You've got to be like, I'm sorry, I only work under these conditions because that's my most productive use. And if it offends people, I got to not care. I got to just lean into my weird. Otherwise, I'm going to be capped, you know? Yeah, you know, this reminds me of those Hollywood stories where maybe the lead actor on set 
would get sick or just be having a bad day or whatever it may be. And they shut down the whole day of work for that day. Like, oh, you know, Nicole Kidman's not feeling well or Will Smith has some stuff that he needs to take care of today. We'll just come back and do this again tomorrow. And when you think about the status of those people, how important they are to the production, they've kind of earned that grace, right? They, they've earned the, the, the freedom to be in that position. If you're a new actor, you're just starting off, you're an extra on the set, and you're like, oh, I've got some stuff I need to tend to today. Well, you haven't done 20 films, you haven't won an Oscar, you haven't proven your value, and so you might just lose that opportunity. You may never get the call again. So in some ways, so the question is, if I didn't show up for office hours, would you carry on, or would, you, or would we have to put everything on pause? <laughs> but, but, but there's a sense in which you kind of have to earn the right or, or, or earn the freedom to do it your way, and not like in an absolute sense. Mm-hmm. There are degrees mm-hmm. that it, it, incre- it expands over time. But let's say you're one of those eccentric types who's like, I don't start my workday until 1 p.m., but I go until five in the morning, right? You can be extremely productive that way. That's a lot of work. However, the average job, you never make it in your first year if people don't know who you are and that's how you come in. However, if you establish a reputation for being really valuable, then people back off a little bit and they say, well, you do it your way. And, I'm, and I don't think that weirdness is causal. It's not the cause. Like being not weird will make you successful. And then once you start to, you know, once you're average or you get, you know, sort of successful, being weird will cause you to be more successful. I don't think it's causal. I think it's specialization is the causal factor. So mm-hmm. when you start out, you're not good enough at any one thing to be a specialist. So you've got to be kind of a generalist and you've got to have some fair amount of flexibility and optionality as you dabble and learn. And then all of a sudden you figure out that like doing one kind of branding process, you just like accidentally stumble into you're amazing at and you get a reputation and you become best in the world at it and you get in high demand. And now you got to say, okay, now I'm specialized because I get the highest returns for this. That means I got to tune out everything that distracts me from this. And whatever weird habits and whatever contribute to this, I got to go all in on those. And so it's it's almost like a byproduct of specialization, I think. But it's something that if you try to suppress it at some point in your life, you're going to limit yourself. But early on, if you don't sort of allow yourself to, yeah. you know, suppress it to a degree, then yeah. it might limit you. This reminds me of something earlier. We were talking about um, Christopher Lockhead, the author of Niche Down. And this idea, because the name of his podcast is Legends and Losers, and I was asking you about that, like, w- w- like, like, who are the losers? You know, I, I get a podcast about legends, and you were saying something like every legend, in one sense, is a loser in another sense. Th- th- this feels connected, like the idea that 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 these people get to this level where they're really weird, and they're weird because they're great at something but they're also out of place with other stuff that people get. Yeah, so in fairness to Chris Lockhead and uh, the Phenomenal Legends and Losers podcast, I don't know exactly why he chose that name, but I've yeah. seen him tweet some things like, every legend was a, a loser first before they became a legend or something mm-hmm. like that. And so mm-hmm. in perhaps he's using it as like, a, hey, everybody's got to start somewhere. And like you yeah. always start out as a nobody until you prove something. But there's another element that it makes me think of that reminds me of, uh, I think it's in Zero to One, Peter Thiel's book. It's certainly in a blog post's lecture notes about a a talk he gave called Founder as Victim, Founder as God. And he's talking about like tech founders, really successful ones. And he's talking about this idea that they're both insiders and outsiders, right? So like they're insiders in that they're in this elite circle of highly successful people that have sort of status as an insider that like others want to be in the room with them, so to speak. But they're outsiders in the sense that like they've always been sort of weird and on the fringes in some way. So like Mm -hmm. on the one hand, they're like cool big time winners, but on the other hand, they're like weird outside losers. And that's kind of what enabled them to become the winners, right? It's like the opposite of high school where like Mm -hmm you've got to be sort of a least common denominator appealing to everybody to be like cool and win, you know, class yeah. king or whatever, <laughs> right? But like in the world, especially the tech world, where some of the skills are these very specialized skills that are in a way kind of like well-suited to antisocial outsider type people, um, the way to become an insider is to be an outsider, you know? Hey, so I, this leads me to a question <clears throat> that I think about a lot, and it's this idea of being balanced. When I look at people that 
I would want to be like or people that just impress me, they don't seem to be balanced. I, I'm not going to say they're unhealthy, but they don't seem to care about being equally good at a whole bunch of stuff. They're usually obsessed with one or two things and they create a ton of value, but they may be horrible at something else that's kind of useful to be good at, like maybe showing up on time or maybe managing their money, whatever it may be. They just may be horrible, have quirks at things. What do you think about this idea? And it's a very kind of schoolish concept of, hey, uh, a little bit of history, a little bit of English, a little bit of math, a little bit of science, because the way to be intelligent and ready for the world is to know all these different sorts of things versus especially when people are young, if you see someone gravitating towards music being like, you know what? I I'm cool with sacrificing quality on math. Just go all the way. And, 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 what do you think about that? I think the idea of like this sort of like surface level dabbling in everything as this obligatory way to be balanced is just stupid. I mean, it's like, whose definition of balanced? It's like, it's dumb. It makes no sense to me. Like, are you moving towards your goals? Are you feeling satisfied and fulfilled? Whatever that is, that's balance. I don't care about somebody else's definition of like, oh, but there's no art in your life. I don't care if I'm happy and whatever, right? So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's stupid. I don't think there's anything about it that's inherently good. I will say, like with this weirdness ROI idea, it's just a matter of costs and benefits. So like, you know, if you lose yourself in something, just know that if you're like incredibly knowledgeable on impressionist painting and you're super ignorant on everything else, there are going to be certain costs to that socially and whatever, um, but there are going to be certain benefits to that. And if you're comfortable with that trade-off and you own it, like, that's fine. If you're like, eh, I want to make sure that I'm like, you know, keeping a lot of options open. Um, I think there's something to be said for like open-mindedly being curious about a lot of things. So yeah. you can, you know, if you're, you'll, you'll figure out where your best specialization is over time if you kind of aren't closed off to things. Right, like but don't I, specialize too early. But I think people create that false dichotomy. We've talked about this a lot where they're like, okay, well, so that I don't specialize too early, I'll just never like really dive in, get lost in anything. And I don't think that's actually, I don't think those things go together. Yeah. So like if you lose yourself in something and do nothing but that one thing for three months, six months, whatever, you don't just learn that thing. You learn how to master something. You learn how to lose yourself in something. And that's totally transferable. And you can see this with kids. They'll lose themselves in something and memorize everything about it and be obsessed with it for three months. And then they'll get completely bored with it and never talk about it again. And they'll move on to something else. And it didn't harm them. It didn't pigeonhole them forever. Whereas I think like turning on a bell every 50 minutes and saying you're never allowed to concentrate on anything for longer than that is actually really detrimental. So yeah, I, I yeah. you know I, I don't think that you like you know can't be <clears throat> well rounded even if you obsess over one thing and get lost. I actually think we need more of that. You know, there's a lot of people who can like do a shitty job at ten things, and there's not very many who are dominant at one. You know. Yeah, and there's kind of like this this myth that if you go deep on one subject and and you just drill down that you can actually do that without interacting with a whole bunch of other subjects. It's like if you take something like math and you just keep going and you keep going, you're going to intersect with things like philosophy, with things like physics, with yep. things like history. There's no way to just study the same thing over and over again without being forced to interact with other fields because every discipline has interdisciplinary connections. But here's what I really liked about what you said. You said, whose definition of being balanced? And, I, and I, I think you're undercutting a really big assumption that's really easy to overthink. And that is, no matter what definition of balance you come up with, that's still going to lead to a very imbalanced life relative to an equally plausible, different definition. So let's say you take the approach of a little bit of math, a little bit of English, a little bit of science. Okay, is learning how to do laundry in that? Because I don't know any schools that are focusing on that, right? Um, and that's arguably more balance. Is learning how to cook or prepare meals a part of that? You know, is is any training in conflict resolution a part of that? Fixing broken computers a part of that? Like we can, any of us can make a list of ten things that every human being should know, and those lists are all going to disagree. No matter how balanced you think you are, if you really believe you're balanced, that's only because you're so imbalanced that you aren't aware of the diversity of philosophies out there about how to prepare for life. Let's take some questions, man. Let's do it, man. Let's do the uh, too long, didn't read version first, and then we'll go back and read the questions <laughs> with context. Uh, number one, is it possible to go too far with the permissionless mindset? 
Um, with the mindset, no. With the application of it, uh, yeah, probably. Same, same answer. Number two. Cheater. Am I required to do everything my boss asks me to do? You're not required to do anything. Period. <laughs> you just, you just, you're coasting, you're drafting off of me. I'm doing all the hard work. I'm Shaq today, man. You're, you're just, Kobe and I'm Shaq. It's the regular season. You're faking injuries. Just get me to the playoffs, man. And then I'll come up with a, with a one-liner to just slam dunk at home. Hey, you know, you, bring it. you know, Phil Jackson know how to play. Kobe know how to play. <laughs> Nobody gets that. Like only two people get what we just did. <laughs> all right, oh, question okay. number one. You two have said a lot of things about adopting the permissionless mindset and taking creative risk without waiting for someone to give you the green light. But is it ever possible to go too far with this? As an example, let's say I'm applying for a job and the requirement is for everyone to submit a written description for why they would be a good candidate. Because I'm a creative person, I want to make a video instead. Would this be me being creative or would it be an example of the permissionless mindset? Uh, would I be seen as a go-getter or a person who doesn't follow instructions? Yeah, again, this is uh, never, I would never like to cram anything through the lens of like, do, don't, right, wrong. It's all about what's likely to happen mm -hmm. and is that, what do you prefer to happen? Mm -hmm. And, you know, increasing the probabilities of the things you want and not the things you don't want. So, you know, in this case, there's a couple of ways you could approach it. I mean, the first is, A, I'm me, I'm unique, I wanna make a video, I'm gonna make a video. And if the person I wanna work for is so uncomfortable with something like that, it might be that they're not a good fit for me to work with anyway, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, if the thought of doing that and making a video instead of the written thing makes you stressed and uncomfortable, that's probably a good sign that like, mm, that's probably a little further than you're comfortable with, right? If the idea, the fact that the question's being asked kinda of makes me think, that the questioner is not quite 100% ready to, to go all in on that strategy and yeah. to own the outcome and yeah. to be like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm doing a video. I'm not even going to send the written thing. Like if you feel that way about it, just do it, you know? Yeah. But if you have this like, oh, I'm stressed. If I send a video, maybe, I'm... then here's a simple way to split the difference. To signal both that you understand instructions and you respect them and you have no problem giving somebody the thing that they asked for because it's not like violating your code of ethics or something. And you are also somebody who's creative and out of the box. Say, hey, you asked for a written description. Here it is. But I wanted to do something a little more spicy too. I made this video. Check it out. Yeah. That's yeah. a great way to split the difference, you know? Yeah, and and like so that. again, I would just say whatever, when you think about clicking send, if it makes you stressed and you're going to roll around at night and, you know, scared to get the reply, then like maybe you took a strategy that you yourself aren't comfortable with and I probably wouldn't advocate that. But if it makes you excited... Um, then that's a good indication that like, yeah, go for it, you know? Yeah, you know, what's interesting about the, the, the permissionless mindset is whenever it's talked about, it's usually contrasted with something like following instructions, doing what you're told, navigating according to the existing map and other kinds of analogies, metaphors, and so forth. And I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. You know, I, I often say that before you can go the extra mile, you have to go the original mile, right? Going the extra mile isn't saying, I'm not gonna do the first one. It just says, I am more than someone who does what is required. I can, do, I can do better than that. I can go beyond that. But sometimes you gotta do that before you can go beyond that, whatever that is. And I, I do like to signal that I know how to pay attention to detail and I know how to make people feel heard. That's important to me. So if you ask me to do something and it's part of our agreement or our arrangement for me to do it, I like to get it done in the way you ask me to get it done. And if I think I have a better idea, I can spend my own energy, my own time, and my own resources giving you that better idea. And if you like it more, now you're free to choose that. But I didn't put you in a position where you have to either choose mine or yours but it's easier for you to buy into what I want by saying, here's what you asked me to do. And just in case it helps or makes things better, here's a little bow I wrapped around it as well, you know, for the future. One of, one of the nice things about that approach too is that it takes a lot of the pressure off of the alternative that you want to create. So if you just create mm -hmm. the video, now this person's going to be comparing, you know, maybe some other applicant. Wow, they really nailed this written description. 
Man, this other person, you know, she she didn't do a written description. She did a video, which is kind of cool and kind of bold, but the video like wasn't quite on pace, so I don't really know what to think of it. They're, remember, they're comparing you to a whole bunch of other people, and so there is a huge value to standing out and being memorable, but there's also a value of giving them an apples to apples because they're going to yeah. be like, I don't know how she stacks up to these others. And so when you do both, they can say, well, she did a good job on the written thing, like, you know, as good as some of these others, maybe not the best, whatever. But then she also did this video. Yeah. And if the video is only so-so, yeah. it's still a benefit to you. Whereas yep. if you don't do the written thing, a lot more is riding on that video, you know? Yep, absolutely. All right, number two, how do I politely refuse a request from my boss to go make her coffee or any other job that is not my responsibility? I think this is a tough one, man. Like, like, like the, the yeah. obvious answer should be like no, but I don't think it's that simple. That's yeah. why it's being it's asked. It's very tough because, it's, again, like it's hard to answer without a whole bunch of information because it's so contextual. So, you know, if if you have some sense of I never want to work a job where I have to make coffee for anyone or that's expected of me, then like you're in the wrong place. Or just you know, it's going to be worth it for you to take the risk to say, hey. I don't want, if my job entails making coffee, I just don't want it to be a part of my job. And if it means you lose your job, you, if you're like okay with that, right? I'm not that type of person who's that extreme. I, I like really don't care about like menial work or whatever. Like sure. I can totally navigate around that. If there's something I like in the job, like I used to work for a guy who'd like, you know, want me to do his laundry and like, hey, would you transcribe this thing that I recorded myself talking on a tape, a cassette recorder? And, would you, and he'd ask yeah. me to do all this stupid, crazy stuff that was just yeah. like, and I would just laugh. I'd be like, whatever. And I'd like do it. Sometimes the stuff that he'd be like, write this into a thing and submit it to the Wall Street Journal. And he'd be like, I'd be like, it's not that good. I'm not going to submit it because you know he's not going to remember. Like I would do, have some discretion on that. But it didn't, it didn't matter to me because there were other things I liked enough to where I was like, I don't care. That's just like a cost to bear and it's not a big deal. I don't, I didn't have too much pride about it. But if you're in a position where someone's asking you to do something that you're like, I will go home thinking less of myself if I do this mm. every day, mm. then it's worth it for you to either quit or say, because you, 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 can't, you can't bluff. If you really yeah. don't want to do it, communicate that, but only communicate that if you don't want to do it so much that you're okay if you lose your job over it. You know, Because if you're just like, I don't really want to, but I really don't want to lose my job, so I'm going to go bluff and be like, put down a hard line. Now you can go say, hey, you know, it's not like I'm going to quit over it, but I, I really don't really like making coffee all the time. I kind of feel like that's, you know, another approach would be, can you find an intern or somebody who is excited about making coffee and be like, hey, you know what? I've been making coffee. Would you want to take on the coffee making duties and yeah, like find yeah. a way to like navigate around it without ticking anybody off? I don't know. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of ways to address it. It really just depends on your preferences. I, I, I can't think of any answer that's like, yeah, this is this is the solution to this problem. But I don't know. You tell me, TK. Yeah. You know, so so I, I tried to think about this from the employer side um, because I I think it's easy to read a question like this and assume that the employer is being unfairly demanding. But most forms of communication are the result of people just having two different set of assumptions about what's expected, and both sets of assumptions being obvious to each party. And a lot of times when I coach people who are having conflicts, it really is the case where one party is thinking, duh, and the other party is thinking, duh, and, and they just haven't made explicit their assumptions. So there could be a need to make sure you refine your understanding of what your job actually is. Because your job is not measured merely by what you feel good doing or what you think is valuable for the company. Your job is also measured by what that other person genuinely believes they are paying you for. That doesn't mean you have to do it, but that's a very easy thing to not get clear on. It happens more than people think. So I, I would use this as an opportunity to take, take the time to do that. Now, if you've been hired as the computer technician and you work like in the back room and that's all you do is work on computers and your boss walks away around the office just to you and they're clearly picking on you, go make me a coffee, boy. I mean, something like that is pretty obvious, but I don't know what your position is. Are, are, are you an intern and you, you're, you're brought on as a utility player to do whatever needs to get done? I don't know, but I, I would treat that as an important you know, aspect of it. So, so here's an interesting observation that I've kind of... I've kind of noticed throughout my career, the the more secure you are with yourself, 
the less you notice and care about that kind of like menial stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. and this is ten often entry level people are way more sensitive about you know, being expected to take out the garbage or do then like you brought me a coffee then today. like CEOs or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like I bring you coffee, you bring me coffee. <laughs> you know, if I were to say, you know, Hey Cameron, would you mind cleaning the bathroom? Cameron, our COO wouldn't even, Im- there would be no part of him that would have an initial reaction of being offended. Yeah. Right. But if I say that to somebody who just started, there's a much higher likelihood because they're more insecure with their identity and the company, whatever else. And I think yeah. the sooner you can get secure, enough to where you're like, I'm not threatened by the fact that someone, like, who cares if people think of me as the guy who does the garbage? If I do it well, and I'm not unlike this, you know, unlikable, who cares, right? Like, yeah, actually, yeah. we should test this out. Hey, <laughs> hey Cameron, <laughs> can you make us a coffee real quick? Well, you, you take that phrase, man, that's <laughs> not my job. That, that phrase is usually pointing to something that's condescending or demeaning to do, right? That's not my job. But that can also be a badge of honor. That's not my job. When, when you make it a habit of doing the things that aren't in your job, that's the going right. the extra mile right. stuff that we talked about. That's stuff that makes you really valuable. And, and, and we're presupposing in our answers here for the guy on YouTube that's going to be like, oh, okay, so if your boss asks you to jump off a cliff, you're going to do that? No. <laughs> Obviously, if it's dangerous, self-destructive, unethical, <laughs> well, you know, you say no, you don't do it. Cameron, but- <laughs> go smash some windows in the parking lot. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I keep picking up. Cam- I wish Cameron could hear us. He must have headphones on or something because I truly wanted him to come bring, bring a cup of coffee in here just to bring home the point. But it, it honestly is like a flattering thing. Like, I you know, sticking with the Cameron example, I wouldn't feel weird or bad at all being like, hey man, I got to take off. Would you mind sticking around? And you know, when the cleaning crew comes in, ask them to do this, or would you mind sweeping up that thing, whatever. And it's, it's like, it's almost like, a, like you said, a badge of honor because I know this dude. Mm-hmm. I know how much he's devoted to the company. I know how trustworthy he is. I know that if if he did have a reason for not wanting to do it, he would just tell me. We have a trust and communicate. Like, it's kind of like being asked to do something like that. I don't know. In a way, it's a sign that you you know you've proven yourself. I mean, as stupid as it sounds, if you make a bad pot of coffee or take forever, you probably won't get asked again. If you make a good pot of coffee and you're reliable, maybe you'll get asked again, and maybe that's okay because being reliable in one thing might make people think you're reliable in other things. You know. All right. So I, I want to answer a version of this question where <laughs> I, I make a few presuppositions okay. that that this is a situation where someone is kind of. Being addressed condescendingly. Yeah. It's like a, it's um, like a power move or just like a jerk. Yeah, move. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. go fetch me a coffee, boy. They don't say it like that, but yeah. it feels like that, and that's what's really going on. Now, it's easy to say, coffee. "Hey, if you don't want to do it, don't do it." But what makes these situations hard is how the heck do you say that when you know there's such a great risk? When you know there is a hierarchical. Uh, Difference. I always get you know messed up on that hierarchical. Yeah, I was gonna say, what are you trying to say there? Hieroglyphics. When there's a higher, hieroglyphic interpretation. It's yeah, a lot of R's. How, how do you say it? How, how do, you, do you just say I prefer not to? I mean, what do you do? So I was, I had a, uh, as you were saying that, I had a very clear thought in mind that was going to shed light on all this, and then I forgot it when you got stuck on hierarchical. Um, <laughs> You know, so I, I, I'm trying to think, see if I can, usually if I just start talking, then my brain will like, you know, catch up with my mouth. Um, leap, leap and the net will appear. Okay, so you're, so you're in a situation where someone really is truly being a jerk. Uh, oh, this is what I was going to say. Again, I think it comes back to being secure in yourself. If, if you're doing something that you truly don't want to do, the thing that makes it hard is fear, is fear of, well, I don't even want this job if it means this but I'm scared to lose this job because what else can I do? Like have a little security in yourself, have some faith in yourself. Like I'm fine. I'm going to be fine. Like I don't need this job. Hold it loosely. And if all of a sudden you're like, I don't need this job, I'll be okay. Now you can ask the question, do I want this job? If it means this, and then you can ask it in a way that's sort of free from all the stress. If the baseline assumption and we have in like our animal brain, the baseline assumption is I can't lose this job. Well, then the whole thing feels stressful. Then you're just like all tight and like, oh, but I don't want to do this, but I can't lose the job. But I'm, and if you just tell yourself, yeah. I don't need to work here. I don't need to, I can do whatever I want to do. I'll be fine. Yep. yep. Now you can start to think clearly. 
and you can assess it. And it doesn't feel like this life and death matter because it isn't a life and death matter. Mm. And if it's like, hmm, would I rather work here and make coffee or refuse to make coffee and maybe not even work here? Or just, it's not about making the coffee. If your boss is truly like jerky, condescending, like you just get to ask yourself, do I want to work with somebody like that or not? Because like I got other options. You know, yeah. it's almost like being in an abusive relationship. The first step is realizing that you will and can survive without that person. Now you got to assess how bad is it really and, and is it, you know, um, is it actually an abusive relationship or am I just being nitpicky, you know? Yeah, you know, w- w- one thing I'll, I'll throw on top of this is- It's like, uh, it's like having an abusive co-host of a podcast, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but okay, here's another piece. Nothing without me, TK. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I'll, I'll, I'll throw on top of this is don't be passive aggressive. Like just be, oh, God. be honest if you don't like something. I've had a bugaboo about passive aggression lately. Yeah, man. I mean, so sometimes in life, people will- make offers and requests that just don't work for you as presented, right? Um, if I say, um, Isaac, pay me five bucks for this can of water, maybe that's a good price for him and he can say yes to it. Maybe, maybe that's too high for him and he doesn't want to say yes to it. Well, to, to be passive aggressive would be like, oh, $5? Is that the price that you just quote for people who look like me? Or to, be like, like, or to be like, I really... I don't know. I mean, I guess I just won't be able to use the five dollars for that thing I wanted to use it for. You know, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. like yeah. implying something that I hope you'll catch on to, and that I hope you'll change your mind instead of just being like, mm, "Would you come down to three? You know? Yeah, yeah. It's like okay, if you don't like what's being offered or requested, formulate in your mind a clear idea of what you do want, right? Um, nah, you know, I, I can't do five dollars. Would you be willing to sell it to me for three? But when when you're passive aggressive about it you're still kind of hoping that the other person will catch the hint and take care of you. And what happens if they don't? Like, don't yep. put your power in the hands of somebody else catching a hint and no, taking that, care of that you. that whole idea of, well, I'm not going to tell you what I want the outcome to be. I'm going to communicate my feelings and hope that you figure out, oh, this person feels bad. Let me change the outcome so they feel better. Like, just tell me what you want the outcome to be instead of like, oh, I don't know, $5 just, that really stresses me out. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, now I'm putting it all on you to take my feelings yeah. and provide a solution that accommodates them. Like, no, that's BS. Grow up, you know? Yeah, be like, yeah. who cares if they feel for you, if they don't, they, don't bring in all that stuff. Just be like, mm, I yep. just don't think I'm willing to pay $5. Let me think about it, you know? Yep, here's the underlying principle. People don't respond to you based on the emotional experiences you have about the way they treat you. They respond to you based on how you train them to treat you. And you train people to treat you a certain way by establishing healthy boundaries and clearly communicating what it is you want. But you know, if someone's asking you for something every day and you feel stressed out by it, they're not responding to your internal feeling of stress. They respond to your behavior. So if you swallow your feelings and then you just go do what they say, you're teaching them to keep asking you to do that thing. So you've got to communicate what outcome you want and establish boundaries because that's what they respond to. Hey, I'm going to throw one more thing on this whole like making coffee, whatever thing. And again, let's like whatever, assume that it's not some horribly abusive, you know, condescending type of thing. I think if you don't look at it in terms of what I do and don't want to do, what I ought to do, and you look at it in terms of where do I want to go with my career and what can I see as an opportunity, there's a very real way in which the person who is noticeably unhappy about being asked to do menial tasks is missing a huge opportunity and they will get passed up by people who seize it. So I can tell you, no matter how how much power you perceive your boss has over you and how they can tell you whatever you, they want, you know, whatever. That's not how they experience themselves. Bosses do not experience themselves as having tons of power. Why? Because like- Even if they act like that to you. Telling people yeah. what to do, firing people, telling people stuff they don't want to hear is awful. It's the worst part about any job, any managerial role, whatever. People don't want it. They would always prefer to avoid it. And so- when you have somebody who you've asked them a couple times, hey, would you mind taking out the garbage? And they kind of give you a look or they kind of have a vibe that's like, I'm a little put off by this. Whether it's conscious or not, you're going to be like, oh, I need the garbage taken out. And you're gonna be like, eh, I don't wanna ask. No matter how lowly the employee, I don't wanna ask them because like they always kind of give me a time about it and they always kind of like act like it's an inconvenience. And the person who never acts inconvenienced by it will, again, it's often subconscious. 
you will want to ask them to do stuff. And it will, it will move from the garbage. Hey, this person's always up for anything. They're mm-hmm. always up to help me out when I need something in a pinch. Hey, would you mind taking a look at this PowerPoint mm-hmm. and give me some feedback? Yeah. Hey, and all of a sudden, they're gonna be in the boss's office and they're gonna be getting better responsibility and more jobs. Why? Because bosses are human too. And if you send a signal that says, it's like a porcupine sticking up its quills, right? Like, yeah. come near me and you will pay for it emotionally or psychologically because yeah. I'll have an attitude then you're gonna to go to the person who's easier to approach, who makes you feel good when you go and ask them to do something, right? And it's not yeah. like, oh, please, Mr. Boss, give me more slave work to do. I don't mean like that, being like yeah. fo- fake and phony. But if you send that signal, if it's like, geez, this guy's always put off when I ask him for something, it's not that they're gonna even fire you, it's just that they're not going to want to approach you with stuff. And that's not necessarily something you want, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, for the person who might be listening to that and thinking, well, man, I, but I don't want to be like the the little lackey. I don't want to be like the yes man. Like, oh, yes, sir, boss. I wouldn't want you to feel uncomfortable about uh, that, me taking I mean, out the garbage. That makes a boss uncomfortable too, by the way. <laughs> no, when you go too far in the other direction and you're like, yeah. oh, I never mind the girl. I'll be happy to take it out. Yes, please. Uh, what more can I do for you? It's like, no, no, I just take out the garbage. That's it. It's not a big deal. You know, yeah, like yeah. you can get weird about it. And this goes back to what you said earlier. It's it's all about predictive reasoning. It's not about, is the boss right for asking me? Am I right or wrong for saying yes or saying no? No, no. It's all about predictive reasoning. It's about the ability to anticipate what kind of outcomes you're going to get from your choices. And then you make choices based on the outcomes you want and you just own your decision. There's no right or wrong about it. It's how you want to play the game. Hey, man, is that a wrap? That's a wrap. All right. Game over. Peace out.